La Casa Cerrada, the closed house. A small street in Tacubaya, a suburb of Mexico City. And a gray building with a large window set in a sober, almost cold facade. But this is certainly the right address. 14 K. A. Francesco Ramirez. So this must be it. The house designed for himself by Mexico's legendary architect, Luis Barragan. The front door opens onto a narrow room, with another door at the far end. It's furnished with a plain wooden bench. Anyone who visited the architect first had to sit here to put himself in a reflective mood. When the iron door has swung shut, blocking out the sound of the street, and only a few weak rays shine through the yellow fanlight, the room becomes a kind of lock for entry into the world of an architect who was full of contradictions. You can only find yourself, Baragan ascertained, in a dialogue with solitude. But then the vestibule opens up and stuns the visitor with a pink so loud you can almost hear the trumpets of a Mexican mariachi. Bright pink is the signal color of the palette of Mexican folklore, a palette based mainly on hues found in nature. Barragan incorporated these shades into his architecture, supplemented them with others, and invested the whole ensemble with a true highlight, a golden canvas. Located at the top of the staircase in the vestibule, it reflects the sun's rays, casting them into the pink room. The play of light and shade, indeed the entire rest of the house, is like a theatre production. When the door at the front of the vestibule is opened, the visitor is confronted by a white wall. The view to the left is blocked by a screen, and only when this too has been passed does the room open up on the central area of the house, the living room. Almost as if he had just left after quickly arranging them on a monk's desk, these photographs and documents tell of the architect's life. In his heart, it says in a biography, he was always a landscape gardener. But you wouldn't think so from the rampant growth in the garden. Yet that is precisely what Baragan wanted, dense, jungle-like vegetation in front of his living room contrasting with the almost geometrical order on the adjacent patio. Re-entering the house from this forecourt means passing through the studio where Baragan worked until his death in 1988. When he started building his house four decades previously, he was already 45 years old. Influenced by the modern movement in Europe, he had already experienced highs and lows in his career. In designing his house, Baragan was no longer prepared to compromise. The only commitment he felt was to his own tastes. Accordingly, he located his studio on one side of the central living area and the two dining rooms on the other. One of them, where he used to have breakfast, is only a few square meters in size. Right next to it is a more representative room, where Baragan used to wine and dine his guests. Like the lounge, all the rooms on the quieter side of the house look out onto the garden. The ingenious division of this room only becomes apparent when seen from above. Screened off by partitions, like on a theatre stage, in the middle there is a library. The ceiling, with the visible wooden beams, is of double storey height while the whitewashed walls make the room seem even higher than it is. The monochrome surface is broken up by a wooden door. Like a picture that has been hung, it is set high up on the wall. The steps of the banisterless wooden staircase connected with the floor. 
The living room takes up the entire width of the building and thus leads from the garden to the side where the road is and to the large windows standing out from the grey façade. Here the light is reflected by a yellow canvas. Like the golden reflector in the vestibule, it was created by a German artist Matthias Göritz. A picture in a picture, and one of the most interesting features of Baragan's house. This too seems to have been arranged intentionally. The opposite corner of the room is a kind of spectator's area for a presentation in which every decorative element, even the most minute detail, plays a role. With his staircase protruding from the wall, Baragan paid homage to one of the leading European architects of his day, Le Corbusier, who had created a similar construction with concrete. But Baragan's staircase is made of wood, a structural and handicraft masterpiece which has come to be seen as a kind of trademark of the Mexican artist. Behind the wooden door at the end of the staircase, there are two other rooms, a small mezzanine and a bedroom for guests. Banagan located his private rooms on the other, quieter garden side. Is this a bedroom or more a monk's cell? Even though it might look rather spartan at first glance, the room has a rather luxurious ambiance with deep armchairs and a broad view of the garden. But what kind of a person was Luis Baragan? What do the things he surrounded himself with tell us about him? Does a light summer hat indicate that he was a dandy? Or does it make him a hermit if he ate off plates inscribed with the word Soledad, solitude? We must always assume that in the case of an architect, all the decorative elements, paintings, sculptures and other objects were also chosen very deliberately, especially when the concept of a creative synthesis of the arts is as clearly represented as it is here. Reflected in one of the many spherical mirrors, but again distributed at the strategically most important points in the house, is the dressing room. A crucifix on the wall, and the plain furniture made of natural materials indicate that this was the home of a religious person who was close to nature. The fitted cupboards were also designed by him. A sign of the perfectionist even the handles have edges. And the riding equipment and statues of horses, which appear time and again, bear testimony to a keen equestrian. Born into a wealthy family, naturally Baragan had grown up with horses. And in Las Arboledas, a northern suburb of Mexico City, he created an architectural monument to his love of horses. The fountain in the avenue of giant trees is just the right height for horses to drink out of. At the same time, the basin made of black granite seems like a giant mirror the whole world could sink into. Architecture, besides being spatial, he noted, is also musical. That music is played with water. With this in mind, he composed new fountain designs time and again. His work in the 40s and 50s ranged from fountains and parks to monasteries but UNESCO decided only to include his house in its World Heritage List. The perfect example of his work as a whole, it embraces everything. And that includes the landscaping of the roof terrace, which can only be reached via a narrow and at first scarcely noticeable door from the dressing room. And it has a surprise in store. There's no view of the town up here, but a surreal perspective, reminiscent of the work of the celebrated surrealist painter Giorgio Di Chirico. For Baragan, the terrace was a place of peace and meditation. He built the walls high enough to eclipse any thought of the urban chaos beyond them. This romantic illusion, however, can only work when the sound is turned down. Only now does it seem that beyond these walls there might be a promised land, 
where the only sound is that of the gentle murmur of streams and rivers. No contrast could ever be more brutal. Enveloped by the traffic of a city of some 20 million people, not far from Baragan's house there stands a building which documents how far he went in his desire for sculptural architecture. Dating back to 1957, the five towers were a joint project with Matthias Göritz. Today they no longer fulfill any practical function. They are just sculpture, signal shapes and colours and the almost ethereally calm or mystically flowing waters in the exterior and interior areas are now an integral part of the repertoire of international architects. Baragan was one of the first architects to combine all this in a fascinating way with traditional elements from his country's history. In doing so, he found enthusiastic pupils who have perpetuated his visions and concepts, and sometimes even supplemented them with further dramatic effects. Created by Mexican architect Ricardo Legoreta, this wild fountain is part of the exterior area of the Hotel Camino Real in Mexico City. Erected in 1968, the building seems like a tribute to Barragan's genius. The same colours and a similarly pointed play with light and space make Legoreta, pictured here together with Baragan, seem like his most logical successor. A corridor in Baragan's house and the lobby in the Camino Real. The dimensions could not be more different. But when powerful light effects had to be created here too, Legoretta borrowed a trick from his great model, who other than Matthias Göritz designed this golden wall for the hotel lobby. The observer is automatically reminded of the staircase in the vestibule of the house in the Calle Francesco Ramirez. Black and gold located in the last room to be visited in the Casa Baragan, the so-called White Room. This girlitz canvas puts it in a nutshell. The concepts and goals of modernism do not have to conflict with the conservative closeness to nature and deep religiousness. In this case, like gold and black, they fit into the same picture. With walls like these, the desire for solitude too attains a surreal and almost futile dimension. Someone who does not love solitude, Baragan claimed, cannot relate to my architecture. But he was wrong. Today, his closed house is a museum. And the Baragan Foundation presents the Mexican architect's work in exhibitions all over the world.